The future of architecture is about high-performance buildings that are also beautiful. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and in today's episode, I have the great pleasure of speaking with William or Bill Leddy, FAIA, who is a founding principal of the San Francisco-based Leddy Matum Stacy Architects, or LMSA the 2017 recipient of the National American Institutes of Architects Firm Award. So for over three decades, Leddy has been a national leader in the design of environments that promote social justice and advance urgent climate action. LMSA has received over 175 regional, national and international design awards and has been recognized by numerous organizations, including the American Institute of Architects, the French Institute of Architects, the Norwegian Association of Architects, the US Department of Energy, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the National Building Museum. The firm is one of only two in the nation to have received 12 or more National AIA Committee on the Environment Top 10 Green Project Awards and the Institute's highest award for integrated design excellence. So Bill has lectured widely and has served as the visiting professor at the Southern California Institute of Architecture and the California College of the Arts. He has also been a visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, at the Pietro Buscelli Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Oregon, as well as many other awards and chairs. Their firm has recently released a new book, Practice with Purpose, A Guide to Mission Driven Design, which was published uh, this year. And we talk about that in the podcast alongside looking in depth at the role of the business of architecture uh, and the importance of becoming a mission-driven organization. We talk about this idea of relevance and resilience, and we talk about how do we prepare for an uncertain future. So this is a really powerful podcast with lots of really deep uh, insights from Bill. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Bill Leddy. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. William, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I am doing great, thank you. How are you in Northern Excellent. England? I'm very well, thank you. I'm having a. I'm here in the, this hotel room, looking forward to. I'm about to go to a monastery next week, um, a Buddhist monastery up here. So I'm preparing and slowing down. So you are one of the founding partners of Lady Matum and Stacy, based in the in the West Coast. Um, you've got an extraordinary portfolio of work, uh, very diverse. Um, arts, education, public engagement, um, large-scale commercial projects, lots of education, uh, multi-residential projects, uh, a very well-established portfolio of you know d- of design work. You, you yourself as well are a, are a fellow at the at the AIA. Um, you've recently published uh, a book, the the purpose of practice, which we'll kind of, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about as we go along, but let's just start with the, with your career and the beginnings of LMS. How did, how did that start? Uh, well, <clears throat> Richard, Stacy, and Marsha Matum and I have been practicing together, uh, since the early 1980s. Um, and, uh, so we've kind of grown up together as, as, um, as architects, uh, Marcia and I are also partners in life, and um, <clears throat> and we uh, so early in our careers, I, I think we were we, we published an earlier book called um, Constructed Reality uh, in the late '90s that was about our interest in, in those days of connecting through tectonics and craft, connecting buildings to their place, um, and you know as we matured as architects, <clears throat> uh, we, we were, um, we reformed, reformulated our firm in, uh, in 2000 
uh, at, as Letty made him Stacy Architects. And we kind of decided that at that point we'd had a, we'd had a taste of a few, uh, projects with, um, nonprofit mission driven organizations. And, um, we just thought that was an amazing way to spend our careers. Um, mm. that, that it, uh, it was taking, taking profit <laughs> out of the equation to a certain extent, in, injecting, uh, some, some serious economic constraints, but, um, it, 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 it sort of uplifted the entire process of design to something that was more directly engaged with improving people's lives. And, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think if you, if you talk to any, any architect, I don't care who they are. Um, I, I think you'll ask them why they became an architect and, you know, some of them might say to build, to build beautiful sculptures, mm -hmm. but I think most of them will say something along the lines of to make a better, world. And, um, and, and I think this is what we decided to do in 2000. We basically st stopped working for for-profit developers, um, and pretty much stopped doing single family homes. Although there are a few that have, have, have happened since then. Um, and really focused on working almost exclusively with, with nonprofit organizations, um, housing for the formerly homeless, um, uh, and for vet disabled veterans and, the, and, uh, people, people in need of that sort. And, and also schools where, you know, we feel very strongly that, you know, education is a place that needs inspiring environments that connect students, not only to each other, but prepare them for a rapidly changing world. And, um, and that means we think, um, connecting, making envir uh, educational environments that really connect students every day mm -hmm. to the natural world and to each other. So, um, so that variety of work has been intentional and really the design of our practice has been intentional. Um, and this is why we wrote practice with purpose. Um, uh, because we, I think too often, I think in our profession, we, we, we get on a track and we get kind of stuck <clears throat> and we don't really know how to unstuck or unstick ourselves from, from that track. We might be doing a certain kind of, of project type that we don't particularly appreciate, but it pays the bills, blah, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is a, this, this book and our practice is really a, a trying to make a case for, you know, okay, decide what your values are, decide what you, you know, what excites you about making, making environments in the world, and then be intentional about designing your practice around that. I always tell, I always tell students that, you know, if you're a designer, then you should be very mindful about designing the most important, valuable thing that you own, which is your life and design. Mm -hmm. You should be, you should be decide what, what makes you, what brings you joy, decide what gives you meaning and do that and find, figure out a way to do that. And that's more or less what we've tried to do in our practice. That That's a, it's a, a very uh, noble aspiration to do this, to kind of, you know, orientate a business where you're really serving the, the wider audience for architecture, as opposed to always, you know, the, the, the profit driven, clients, for example. Um, if I put my business hat on, my first concern would be, uh oh, if you're work <laughs> if, 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 if you're if you're working with, with clients who's who aren't making profit, what's gonna happen to your profit? And yeah. what what did well, you have to do as a business to make sure that you were you know, to make that financially work? And I'm I'm probably walking into a bit of a, a misunderstanding here as well, or a, a misconception that non profits often don't have a lot of money and that's i know that's not always they, the case they, they don't have a lot of money but you know i think um i think the important thing to and i'm glad you asked that question because that's really the first one that comes up that you know we've got colleagues who say well you know you know how nice for you mr architect living in san francisco you know the mo one of the most progressive cities you know on the planet you know how nice that you've been able to do a practice like this and i think our reaction is always well you know it's true that that we have there's a there's a very robust nonprofit 
community here. Um, you know, affordable housing is subsidized by a variety of different um, government agencies and so forth. But but we have been able we have a we have a firm of thirty seven people right now, and and we're paying people what they need to earn to live in one of the highest cost places to live on earth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're, we're, we're doing okay. And the reason for that is that we've also been mindful about how we've designed our practice from an economic perspective, you know, uh, coining, coining a, a uniquely Californian phrase. We like to say that we surf the bottom half of the wave, um, you know, as the, as the, as the ebbs and flows of the economy go up and down, you know, you don't want to design your practice up here, right? Mm. Uh, you want to you want to design it kind of more or less down here, where where you can be pretty lean in terms of your operation. Um, you know, we've always we've always made sure that that um, that we've kept our overhead as low as we can keep it, and and still you know be have a nice place to work and so forth. And um, and we've been very mindful about hiring people who can do a lot of different things. Um, so that we don't we don't really have any specialists in our office. We're we're looking for folks who are well-rounded, passionate architects. You know, they 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 don't mind getting their hands dirty, going to measure an old, nasty, dirty old building, um, and they don't mind getting out on the job site with the contractors. And they also love designing. So that's the that's the sort of um, approach we've taken. And I think it, it, it maybe gets back to this, again, this idea of being, in, you know, intentional, you know, if you, if you have a budget <laughs> for a building, mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to, and it's a tight budget, you're going to make every move count. And, um, and so we've tried over the years to make every move in our practice count. And, um, and I, I think, I think that's, that's, um, that's worked out just, just great for us. But I think, I think our point of the book is really, look, you know, e even if you um, are trying to, let's say you're trying to wean yourself a little bit or have a little bit more um, agency in, in uh, you know, mission-driven design, um, it, 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 it's not an all or nothing <laughs> equation. Just start out small with a couple of projects and get to know some of the nonprofit organizations in your community and and see how you can bring your skills to help them with their mission. And I think, you know, I, another one of our adages is that you get the work that you do. You know, there's no question that if you if, if all you do is shopping centers, that's all you're going to do. Because yeah. people look at you and they say, oh, that is the shopping center architect. Well, there's nothing wrong with shopping centers. It's just that if you don't want to do shopping centers exclusively, then you've got a problem, right? So so we've tried, this is another reason why we've tried to kind of nurture, a, a, been very intentional about nurturing a kind of a broader range of typology of, of, of building types in our practice so that... Mm -hmm. um, so that we we can keep that variety, and our staff loves that because they're not stuck doing the same thing over and over again, and um, and each job is a new a new exciting new opportunity to get to meet new people who are doing amazing things. So so the the pivot to kind of working solely with nonprofit clients um, this happened around two thousand. Yeah, we had a we had a um, around we had. Two, we had a project before 2000, before in our earlier earlier lives, as a um, that was called the Thoreau Center for Sustainability, and it was one of uh, it was a um, an adaptive reuse of historic um, buildings at the uh, the Presidio of San Francisco, uh, and creating kind of a nonprofit center for environmental foundations, and um, and it was one of the earliest. Um, uh, was very it was before lead, um, and it was one of the earliest sustainable projects that we we worked on back in the late '90s. Um, and um, and and again, I think we, we had this glimpse of of working for really smart, interesting people who had a passion for their mission and and wanted architecture to support that. So um, so then uh, we we sort of reformulated our our practice, thinking, okay, this is a good idea. Let's try this. And um, for, along came the first project that came along was a was a um, an affordable housing project for formerly homeless individuals in in downtown San Francisco, and um, 
was the first um, kind of ground up building of its kind in, in the in the city. And um, and once again, you know, you go to the <laughs> you design this building and you find that, in fact, um, the budgets are tight, but they're not so tight that you can't make architecture. And um, so, uh, you know, we clad this seven story building in in um, in a, 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 a kind of parklex, which is a Spanish made uh, veneer. Uh, wood veneer resin material um, and and designed it so that you could identify each individual unit so that the uh, from the street people who are used to live on the street can point with their friends they can point up and say I live right there and um, and I have to say you know that was the for the open the, the ribbon cutting for that project was was the first moment when we thought right wow this really is important because there wasn't a dry eye in the house. People would, you know, who were, you know, had come off the streets um, and are have, have been given supportive services and drug counseling and and job counseling and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, they they just felt, you know, you could just see that the how the the architecture had helped to dignify them and to help them, you know, get a new start on life. And that mm -hmm. that's a powerful, powerful thing. And uh, you know, it, it. You know, we 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 we're in this. I think really, I think what we make a case in the book about is the fact that we're, um, you know, for better or for worse, we're in this. Um, I think um, perfect storm of the uh, of c colliding events. Um, you know, globally. You know, where. Um, you know, just even since you and I last talked, you know, the earth seems to be on fire. And, you know, what was it I read yesterday that um, the yeah. ocean off the Atlantic Ocean off Florida's coast is 100 degrees. It's like it's a hot tub. And <laughs> I mean, the, in July was the <laughs> was the uh, or has been the hottest month in, in the 125,000 years of Earth's history. And um and meanwhile, you know, the, ca wow. the Canadian forest, 45,000 square f square miles of Canadian forest has burned. And that's bigger than half the nations in the world. So something's going on here. And, and I think, I think it, it, I uh, mean, you know, of course, meanwhile, mm -hmm. we have people the, the climate change is affecting the greatest impact it's having is on people um, of color and people who are, um, um, you know, in, in lower economic uh, constraints. So I, I think part of the reason we wrote the book is that we see we see this moment in history as being this opportunity. Um, it's not an opportunity to feel disconnected and stick your head in the sand and hope that it all goes away because it's not, it's going to get a lot worse, but it's an opportunity for architects who I think have always, yeah. uh, as a profession, we've always, you know, kind of worked at the fringe of relevance, you know, that I think there's been a, there's been a, a big, a big struggle um, to overcome this public, <clears throat> public impression that architects are mostly, mostly white guys doing, you know, fancy homes for rich white people. And, and in fact, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that we can do so much more and architecture has so much greater opportunity to, um, to help address this, mm -hmm. this climate thing. One of the, one of the things I'm doing um, in my free time but, but uh, is that I'm a vice, vice president of climate action for AIA California for, for the state, the statewide, um, um, a chapter of AIA and we have 11,000 members and um, and we've been pushing hard on changing codes. So this is another aspect of where, ad, you know, architecture of the 21st century is about advocacy. It's not just about designing beautiful jewels. It's about mm -hmm. changing codes so that we can continue to thrive in, in, in the marketplace. And so next next week uh, we have a hearing on a yeah. key hearing where we're proposing, along with a consortium of other state agencies and and um, and non and nonprofits, Sierra Club and and um, and and a variety of other um, environmental nonprofits to 
for the first time, include a requirement in the California Building Code that buildings of a certain size have to account for their embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 role does what role does does economics play for the architect to have agency? The world in these, in these yeah the world courses the, yeah well so what I think the point is that the world is changing that codes are changing that we have to we have to keep up or we're going to be become unable to compete in this in this changing marketplace you know let we don't even have to talk about AI uh, <laughs> and how that's going to change the landscape that that's yeah. been that's been discussed plenty enough so far but <clears throat> but I, I I do think that um, that you know, the, the future of architecture is about high performance buildings that are also beautiful and um, that serve communities, that help knit communities together. Uh, because I think if anyone pays attention to the science um, and, to, and to the and to the to, and hopefully believes in science, uh, you're going to you're going to realize that um, what we're seeing this summer is just the beginning of mm -hmm. a really rough patch and that architects have this opportunity to become, you know, relevant leaders in our communities, you know, almost in some ways sort of, um, um, you know, creative problem solvers to bring artful solutions to some of these, some of these challenges. And all of a sudden we're not, we're no longer so irrelevant to the everyday mm -hmm. population. All of a sudden, you know, we, we have, we're in a leadership role and we can, um, you know, help make things better at, 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 you know, from the scale of a small building to the scale of community planning and also, also, um, you know, changing codes that ripple throughout the, um, uh, throughout the world. And I, 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 you know, here in California, we, you know, everyone prides ourselves here in California as being the, you know, maybe a little bit, um, a little bit egotistically, um, the, the center of innovation. Of course, we're not, but um, there's there's a little innovation going on in other places. But that said, um, that's the that's the, the vibe in California sometimes. But I, you know, I think well, it is true that um, it is true that I think people do look to California for what's next, and I. I remember mm -hmm. having a conversation with with our friend uh, Ed Mazaria, who is the founder of of a gold medal AI gold medalist and a, the founder of Architecture Twenty Thirty. And he said, he said, you know, the thing that's really crazy is that whenever I whenever I meet with the energy minister of China or the en energy minister of India, the first thing they ask me isn't what what's the U.S. doing about you know climate change or about the the contributions of of um, uh, buildings in reducing, um, you know, carbon. What's California doing? Uh, <laughs> and for better or for worse. And so I think that's that's a that's an opportunity. And I think you know every everything that we do, what no matter where you are, everything that we do has a ripple effect, right? And I think I think it, these good ideas have a way of rippling outward and 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 mm -hmm. and, um, and and taking on a life of their own. And so. Uh, I, 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 I tell people all the time, I really firmly believe that we are on the threshold of a, a whole new era of creativity and relevance for our profession, and, and we should embrace it. We shouldn't fight it. We should mm -hmm. embrace it as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a creative opportunity and, a, and an opportunity to bring greater meaning to our work every day. Mm, absolutely. I, mean, I, I think we, what you're saying here really echoes the point that the architect is and historically has been in a position of leadership and and occupies this interesting domain where you're interfacing with with clients with politics with end users with the environment and to be able to you know kind of choreograph or curate all of those parties together to a common for a common goal that's really you know that's that's a very powerful position yeah. and there's an and, a, and, a, and a, a kind of the body of knowledge that architects have is you know 
is the kind of little superpower, <laughs> if you like. Yeah, I, I, I really, I, you know, I mean, it's easy to be cynical about being an architect, but I, I prefer not to be. I prefer to, <laughs> I prefer to, to think of us as being uniquely trained, uniquely prepared mm-hmm. for this moment in history. Um, as you say, we're, we're used to, we're used to making things happen in a messy world and, that's a gift. That is, that is yeah. a power. That, I agree. It's, it's our superpower. And, uh, and we should, we should be, I think as a profession, we should be wholeheartedly embracing that. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that folks aren't doing that. I think there's, there's, I mean, in many ways, the UK is way ahead of the U S in, in, in these areas. Um, the reuse of existing buildings, um, all of these things is, is, you know, is, is, are, 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 are happening all around the world. But I have to say that old ideas die hard and Mm -hmm. the, um, the design culture of the 20th century, which was, let's face it, the, the, the greatest, um, orgy of energy consumption the world will ever see um, remains with us. And, and you can see that still happening in, in, in design awards programs where, you know, buildings are awarded despite a lot of blah, blah, blah about sustainability. The design uh, designs are given to projects that um, are plainly not taking into account anything else that's happening around beyond the property lines of, of the, of the, of the project. And, um, and I just think that's, I have to say, I'm the, the more the earth burns, the more, the less patience I personally have architects who insist on being, you know, um, creative artists, um, only, I mean, I think art is Mm -hmm. a huge part of it. If I'm not denying the, the value of beauty, beauty is essential. But if that's the only thing that buildings are about, we're all in trouble. And um, so. So in order to be able to produce kind of high performance buildings, both in terms of their energy consumption and their intelligence with being net zero and also having social meaning, purpose and and drive, what does the what would you recommend the business a high performance business looks like to deliver that kind of that kind of work what sorts of things need to be in place and what what kind of stewardship do the leaders of those practices need to be well that's taking a great control that's of? a great question and i and i think i think it's it's um it's completely circumstantial you know i think in our book we say look you know this this isn't the only way to do this um you know and and i i i really do feel that that one of the key key um, uh, sort of intentions here, or hopes, is that you know there are thousands and thousands of really creative people in the world who who just need maybe to help be helped th- to think a little more broadly, design beyond the property lines of your projects. Think a, more, a little more broadly about who your client really is. Is it just is it just the person writing your checks well that's they're they're very important but it's but it's also you know i think the broader community it's also of course the planet but um so i think in terms of designing a a, a kind of a business structure around this i mean i i think for many years the environmental movement or the sustainability whatever you want to call it movement has hoped that um that these that these high performance uh uh, components of design would just find their way naturally kind of organically into design, right? That we would all just, and this has been actually one of the things that's been interesting to watch, uh, particularly in, in the UK and in Germany where you know, energy codes are, are much more stringent. And I remember, <laughs> I remember talking to Tom Main one time and, he, and about, about, you know, said, you know, about his, his buildings and how, how he had discovered you know, the creative opportunity of connecting to performance as a, as a nut yet another design criteria. And he, he was pretty funny. He said, you know, okay, just want to make sure one thing, I'm not a green architect. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. He's, but he, he, 
he, he, you know, the way I understood his, his point was that he found it to be a really interesting and intriguing, it wasn't a limitation, it was a really interesting and intriguing new area to explore creatively. And I think, I think that's where um, a practice today can mm-hmm. start to work toward that moment. It's not, it's not a, again, it's not a, it's not a, turn that off and turn that on it's it's kind of let's oh. let's let's start to be mindful about moving ourselves in this direction get ahead of the building codes so that when the building codes change we're prepared to you know knock things out of the park and 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 mm-hmm. and and be the be the firm in town that that can really you know do great design and and also um, have it be, um, have these other elements that, that, I mean, yeah. and of course it, it, unfortunately it's rarely mentioned that, um, too rarely mentioned that, you know, when you design a high performance building, we know that, we know that, um, the only area where <clears throat> energy costs are going down is in renewable energy, right? Coal and, and fossil, other fossil fuels are going up. And they will continue to go up as they become more more scarce. So becoming totally fluent in how to make buildings work on either on microgrids or on uh, uh, you know on-site renewable energy uh, systems or whatever it is 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 I think the next economic driver. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, pa- solar power is already the cheapest energy on Earth. So so let's let's why are we why aren't we thinking about that more? And why aren't we, you know, we're, we're so obsessed. Some of us are so obsessed with the, 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 the perfect little bespoke detail. And meanwhile, you know, <laughs> the Titanic is, is, is sinking. And uh, this, this bespoke detail might be a beautiful photograph, but okay. Is that the wider strategy? Yeah. Is that all there is? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, so interestingly, you were, you were saying as well, you know, when you're doing kind of projects where there is, say, a, a more stringent budget constraints that you've got to be really, you know, every move you make is got to be the right move. Yep. And notoriously design, like design isn't like that. <laughs> there is, <laughs> there's a lot of wrong moves that need to be made to make the right move. And, and certainly when I've spoken to architects in the past about, yeah, you know, I've, I've, when I've heard stories of working in some of the largest architect practices, for example, and some of the issues that happen with buildings not getting built because the project has been, you know, you know, the the, the lead architects have been so assured that the architecture is going to wow and bamboozle the client, and they're going to be so impressed that they're going to expand the budget, and then it doesn't happen, and then the project ceases to actually get get built. Yeah or another architect gets chosen. And when we're dealing with projects that are culturally and socially, you know, pertinent and important, that's not a mistake you can afford to make. Right. No. It's, it's like there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a civic responsibility here to ensure that what's being designed is, is buildable and can, get, and can get built. And you've got to be able to run your own business and keep everyone fed in the office and, and pay them. How, how do you... How do you kind of control or put a boundary around the kind of iterate the iterative aspects of architecture and and you know and whilst keeping it buildable and profitable? Great question. Um, you know, I, I and I, and I think it's made even more intensive here in San Francisco, which also has the highest construction costs in the world. And so wow. it becomes even more um, important not, uh, you know, and I think what happens is in the process of designing a building is that, um, uh, you know, sometimes, it, I mean, it, it, it used to be back in the day um, when, I, when I first started my career that architects could have a pretty good idea about how much something might cost. You know, there's a, there was a, you know, the, 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 um, the inflation or the escalation of construction costs was pretty flat for many, many, many years after you know post war, post World War II, and um, and that and that's what was one of the roles that architects played in those days. But no more. I mean, the escalations are are just uh, the co- construction cost escalation is crazy, and so you can't 
you have to you have to take a very methodical approach. And I think part of that is you know, we, to try to the culture that we try to uh, uh, reinforce in our office is look, let's not start with the most complicated thing you've ever seen on on the, on the planet. <laughs> you know, let's start with the slump, the simplest, I mean, dumbest solution to the problem that that get that makes it work and then let's start enriching that you know let's let's take the reverse mm. approach let's start enriching that to the point and then make sure we're getting cost estimates regularly along through the process um and and so and so the the it, it's a it's a different mindset to your point than you know what's the coolest cantilevered Zaha Hadid thing I can do um, to, you know, and, and this, this takes uh, some of our young designers have a hard time with this because it's like counterintuitive, right? I, but I want to make something cool. And I, and I, and I would keep saying, okay, it will be cool when it's, we've arrived at this Zen moment <laughs> where it is all that it needs to be, you know, it's just nothing more, nothing less. And, you know, I, we always we always say around the office, look, this is all about making the most with the least. This is the this is our new. I think it should be the 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 kind of the the battle cry of architects in the 21st century. Let's make the most with the least. And how do mm -hmm. you do that? And how do you how do you how do you bring joy and and delight and inspiration to people, and still not not um not end up a building that doesn't get built isn't doing anyone any good <laughs> yeah. um so uh, anyway that's and, and 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 likewise with your own with your own fees that you get from the from the clients how do you ensure that you're not you know you're not burning through the fees exploring a certain you know this is again this, this is the other the other thing that happens with when uh, architects are getting overly creative is that they're burning through their own fees <laughs> investigating something that nobody's asked them to investigate right. But, right. but i mean it sounds obvious but actually it's that's quite difficult to you know particularly when you're not the, now you know you've got a team you've got people who are independent highly intelligent wanting to investigate things how do you keep them on on in track and kind of connected with the the budget of your own fees <laughs> Do they know that? Do you have a transparency there? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I think um, you know we we also you know years ago we kind of developed a a, a very simple little spreadsheet that allows us to um, uh, come up with fees and um, and and a lots you know I mean there's a lot of firms many firms most do this probably most firms to every, we assign <clears throat> staff levels and we know how many hours a week for how many weeks this person can work on this and and that establishes a schedule and we get very we, we're, we're pretty we're pretty pretty tough on those schedules and um and pretty tough on on making sure that we meet those schedules so in other words we don't you know we don't want to end up in a situation where we've got <laughs> to your point we've got we've got a, a x fee for the schematic design for a uh, you know a three month effort you know, I mean, that's another thing. We're not we're not doing schematic design for like a year. You know, that's that's not. Right. I used to I when I was a student and I would read about uh, Louis Kahn's office, for example. I mean, and he would he and his he and his student colleagues would, you know, design buildings, you know, in schematic design for a year or two years. How does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> I we're happy to get three months, you know. <laughs> Uh, which is why I think this is important. It's just as important to um, to start at a, at a at a you know have a strong idea. You know, it's like like an, any any student coming out of architecture school, what's your big idea? You have a strong idea that 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 organizes the organizes the idea the the um, the, the design, and then just keep working on it. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> and so you know, and we. We don't, we're not, um, many offices, I think, you know, the business side of architecture hold project managers responsible and, and even, you know, kind of maybe, you know, um, you know, ding them if they are not producing kind of on schedule, on time, on budget. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and we don't we don't take that we don't take a punitive approach. We just sort of try to create this culture of well, let's, let's all work together. We're trying to do this great thing, and I think this is another area, by the way, where um, you know working on behalf of people with autism or seniors at risk of homelessness or whatever it might be gives us a little bit greater gives each of us a little greater personal connection to to why this has to work right it's not we're not we're not designing buildings for a sultan in dubai you know we're we're designing housing for people in san francisco who are living on the street mm -hmm. and um and so you know and, and i think this gets back to this idea of what what's design excellence you know what what does that mean and um, this is another thing that we've been working on and trying to help. And I, I think the AIA National has, has taken on this. Uh, this um, basically, they adopted the the um, the ten measures of the um, Committee on the Environment for Design Excellence, and and rebranded re it, calling it the Framework for Design Excellence. So this happened about three years ago now, four years ago. And mm -hmm. My my wife and partner, Marsha Madam, was was one of the instigators of that at the national level. And I think the 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 the, the challenge is that you know we still have architects who are completely ignoring that and are just doing they're still doing their thing. And and I you know again that's great. But if if every student coming out of school aspires to be the next Eric Owen Moss, um, then who more or less ignores this stuff, then, mm -hmm. you know, what, where, where is the profession going to go in that regard? So I think we're trying to be one little voice of, of a, a, a kind of an alternative vision. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you make a living doing architecture? How do you make it meaningful and satisfying and gratifying? How do you make buildings that you're proud of that are beautiful that, that win awards and so forth. And that's, that's the, that's the goal. I mean, they're, they're not going to be these buildings. And I, I would also say that these buildings, because of their budget constraints and because of their performative constraints, which we've tried to think of beauty in a much deeper way, you know, it's not, these buildings don't always win design awards these days, because if there's a, if there's a, <laughs> if there's a jury that is specifically focused on the bespoke detail, then, you know, we couldn't afford this bespoke detail. So that's too bad for us, but that's okay. You know, we're just, we're just doing our thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's, that's very interesting. And that the, that the profession itself has a bit of a myopic approach to what is good design. Um, and you know, what gets, what gets revered in the design world and then in the journals is, you know, it's a very thin slice of what actually, design is all about yeah no i think and, that's you know, i think that's exactly right in fact i think the the the, the, the some of the press around um the current uh, venice biennale has been interesting in that regard because of course mm -hmm. you know I, I i heard a couple of 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 um you know well-known architects you know, of course the focus has been on design for community and um mm -hmm. and i've i've heard a, a number of of quoted a number of um well-known um, architects saying things like, well, that's all great, but where's the architecture? <laughs> yeah, probably not, probably um, Patrick Schumacher, I suspect. <laughs> the... not na I'm not naming names, but I, I just think, I think that was, I thought that was a, that was a very telling comment, you know, where's the architecture? Well, yeah, this mm -hmm. is architecture, you know, sorry guys. Um, let's, let's, let's reframe our, let's reframe our context a little bit here. Mm-hmm. You mentioned there as well the, the kind of, you know, helping people make a living in in architecture. And obviously, this is something that is a very uh, pertinent, prominent topic all around the world is the architecture, you know, the, the average pay of an architect. And having just visited California, I, I've you know, was shocked at how expensive everything was oh comparatively God. to, I mean, in, I mean, here in London, well, when I'm in London, the yeah, the cost of living is very high as well, um, and the similar sorts of problems exist. But 
you know, we're, we're, we're seeing it's becoming increasingly difficult for somebody on an architect's salary to be able to, to, you know, live near their office, for example. Yeah. Um, and we talk about accessibility in the, and diversity in the profession. And for many students, the return on investment just simply isn't, isn't there. Right. If you're coming from a, a socioeconomic um, background, which is less, ad, less advantaged than somebody else investing and, you know, you guys in the U S the, the, the education fees is, is a lot greater than it is here in the UK, but we're, we're slowly catching up. Not that that's a, a great thing to be catching up with. Um, but it's a big investment to, you know, seven years, 10 years training plus a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars and then coming out with, you know, you've got to be paying those debts off and then salaries, which are, you know, they're, they're, they're difficult. They're, they're difficult. How, what, what, what's your advice here for the profession to be looking at to yeah. be improving this? No, this is a huge issue. And I, I, I agree. And I, I think it's particularly with the level of student debt that we're seeing. And, and, um, and I think it's, um, and I, I think it also has an impact on, you know, the diversity that, that we're trying to increase in the profession. You know, if, if, if I'm a, a, a young person of color and, you know, who happens to be talented and so forth and so on, but also academically gifted, you know, are my parents going to say, yeah, go be an architect. <laughs> That's a white guy's profession. Why just go be an architect? You know, they're, they're going to go be a, go be a, a software designer, you know? And I think, I think that therein lies the rub. I think, you know, architects have always, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the challenges we've made, we've had over the years or the, since the inception of architecture is that we were always the gentleman's profession, right? Um, and the people who dabbled in architecture, you know, Thomas Jefferson and, you know, others we can name, we're basically independently wealthy and they could dabble in architecture. And that was sort of the beginning of this idea of architects as being, as being this sort of uh, these gentrified artists um, who didn't really need to make much money because they were having so much fun. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think what now here we fast forward, here we are in, a, in this economy where, um, you know, architects are, are seen as being again, less relevant to the, the, the larger, um, economic engine um, and tech is celebrated as being primary and that and you know and this is we see this in we see we see this at a personal level in san francisco as you might imagine all the time sure, you know, yeah. we, we have 30 something old um staff who are went to harvard and you know are really smart and doing great work and passionate and and you know they know people that they're smarter than, you know, mm -hmm. working for some of the big tech outfits, making three times as much money. And that's just, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just crazy. Right. And I think, I think it exact, well, it also, not only does it, does it drive up the cost of living for everybody else. Right. But it also, um, it also just warps the reality of the economy where, you know, there's really, I always say there's really, there's really two economies happening in the Bay area, right? There's the tech economy and there's the rest of us. And, and how do the rest of us work within this? Well, I think, you know, 30 something architects say, well, just charge more fees. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not quite that simple um, because mm -hmm. there's always an architect who will do it cheaper. That's just the way this works. There's always a young hungry architect or maybe an old hungry architect <laughs> who will do it cheaper and half the price just to get, just to get mm -hmm. the job. So, so that's the competitive marketplace we're working in. And, um, I, I was on a, I was on a AA board call the other day and, and, um, and, 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 uh, somehow this, um, you know, uh, teacher, an academic professor who was out, have to be on the board, um, launched into this tirade about why architects are so such idiots for not charging more money and, and, and paying their, paying their employees more. And, um, and I, and I, I said, okay, so now we're supposed to change the entire economy of the planet. You know, that, that might be a little beyond our creative, you know, creative um, ability, but what we can do and what we're trying to do is mm -hmm. pay as pay a fair wage when we have a year of profit, um, we share it. We don't, you know, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not driving Lamborghinis here. You know, <laughs> we're, 
we're, we're, we share it with everyone and, and, and that helps to make bridge some of the gap, but, um, but it definitely doesn't bridge the whole gap. There's no way that we're going to be able to triple people's salaries coming out of school. Um, sure. but you know, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know what else to say about that. That's really a tough problem. And I, I think without my, I'm hopeful that this idea that we're trying to promulgate of, of, of becoming more relevant to society and be, be seen more as essential workers, essentially essential problem solvers to help our communities become more resilient and, 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 and help create a just sustainable future will, will make us be perceived as having more value. Um, Mm -hmm. but the long, long tradition of architects undercutting, we always just say architects, we eat our young, you know, (laughs) we, we, there's a, there's a long tradition of architects undercutting uh, each other to get the job. And, and that, that tradition I'm afraid is not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and obviously the, uh, it, it's it's the, the tradition of doing lots of free work. You know, there's the undercutting and the kind of just giving work away in order to win stuff, and yeah. that's you know that's prevalent all over the place, yeah. which kind of ends up devaluing your own services, even if you do win the work. Yeah, and it and it and it and it starts to send the wrong message to to um, to young architects that you know they have to work long hours and some of them for, for at no pay as well, which is really mm-hmm. something that we don't do at all. But that's a, I mean, there's a long tradition in, in Europe, I know of, of architects, young architects going to work for an office for free for a while. And yeah. that's something we just don't do. I mean, we pay people, we, we have to, they have to pay, they have to be able to pay rent and they have to be able to mm-hmm. buy groceries. And, and, and so, um, yeah. So anyway, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not for any, any, minute suggesting that any of this is easy but if we sure. <laughs> if we if we wanted an easy profession we wouldn't have become architects and um and i've always been a strong believer and i'm a little old-fashioned i guess in this in this regard and that is that you know i mean i think if you if you're if you're in a profession that really requires your full commitment of your heart and soul um, mm-hmm. to make beautiful, useful things in the world, then you just, you just design your way toward that goal. And you want to make sure that you can have a family and send your kids to college and do all the other things that we have to do. And there's a way to do that. It's just, um, you, you just have to, Every step of the way, you make things a little better. And I, I, I'm, I, again, I think this idea of becoming w- with greater relevance to society and not changing the perception of architects as the bespoke tailors mm-hmm. of, of, of buildings uh, for rich people and, and moving that more toward, you know, architects as, as problem solvers in a, on a changing planet um, uh, to help make environments open for everyone that are mm-hmm. healthy and regenerative and, and beautiful, then, then, you know, this, this is probably a naive hope on my part <laughs> that might start to help change the economic, um, um, a model. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not holding my breath on that, but I, I, I want to hold up. We're trying to hold up our office or our practice as at least one example of how, how we've been able to do this. We've been able to pay people a living salary in the Bay area. Many of the younger folks would say it's probably not quite enough, but Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're doing what we can and, and trying to share as much as we possibly can to help them. Um, And this, this, I think maybe touches on another aspect of our, of our practice that I think a lot of practices do as well, which is really important. I think we have a responsibility to, the young architects as um, to help them learn how to be well-rounded professionals and help them understand the complexities of this practice. And so, for example, we, you know, we, we regularly share our financial information to everybody in the office, you know, as much as they want to see until they fall asleep, you know, <laughs> yeah, once a month, once a year, we sort of, okay, let's, let's look at the books folks. And, and they, 
because they all want to see the books. And I say, okay, well, here's the books. And then they, about halfway through, they say, okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. Just, just, just send me my paycheck. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of information are they usually keen to, 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 to look at? And obviously, yeah, like, like you mentioned there, it actually takes a little, it takes a little something to be able to translate, you know, what you're, what you're looking at. Yeah. I think it's, we, 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 we try to frame it in a way that is pretty clear and understandable. I mean, basically, fees come in, here are labor costs, here are overhead costs. We're trying to keep the overhead as low as we can, blah, blah, blah. And, and here's what, if we're, if we, if we, if we're successful in delivering to our clients projects that are, that are, um, that where we can make a, a, a decent profit, then that profit is something that we share with, with the, with the staff. And, um, uh, and I think they appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, I think it's just the big picture. How, how, do, how do what I, how does what I do fit within the larger business goals um, of the, of the firm? And, um, and then, and then, you know, um, how can I contribute more? I think that's, that's what we're trying to mm -hmm. the kind of uh, 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 culture we're trying to um, uh, engender. Brilliant. So just to conclude here, what, what would be your piece of advice for young architects uh, or perhaps new business owners who are wanting to step into their own stewardship or leadership of their, of their communities, you know, and, and make money whilst doing it? I think it really comes down to values. I think we, we as a profession, probably maybe more than many other professions are, I would argue a values based profession. Um, you know, we, we, um, we help our clients express their values through their buildings. Um, but I think we also have our own values to think about and how do our values and our clients values mesh. So I think the, the first step for a young architect, I believe is to decide what really matters to you. What, what is important to you in the world? You know, what, what do you, what, what would cause you to get up excited every day and go to work um, and, and make, make new things. And, and once you have that, a clear vision of that, um, then you can let that, that um, those, those values, that value structure frame what kind of clients you might want to work with. And, um, and yes, you've got to work for, you know, at starting out, you got to work for anyone who can pay your bills, but, but that doesn't mean that you have to stay in that mode. You can continue to work mm -hmm. toward nurturing clients of like-minded values and, um, and, and start to think about, um, you know, who, who in my community, um, is doing great stuff. And if I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, provide a little bit of extra consultation for free to somebody, you know, it, would it be, would it be a developer who wants to build a, you know, high rise condo, or would it be a food co-op who really needs help coming up with a new vision for their facility or whatever it might be. Um, and I would argue that, that, that that's, that's where that value judgment comes into play. And then I think mm -hmm. once, once you start get, you have a good sense of that. And of course, values change over time, right? It's amazing how, when you get, when you have kids, your, <laughs> your values change pretty radically, but as you, as you, as they change over time, make sure that you're, you're being, you know, trying to be true to that. I think one of the biggest cognitive sources of cognitive dissonance in architects as, as, as we see people aging in this profession is that there's a disconnect between their personal values and the the values they're promulgating for their clients every day and i th yeah. i think that's that can be soul sucking and um yeah. and i think so i think you decide you know it's a it's a basic design problem you decide what you want to do you decide how you want to solve the problem and then you decide you decide the details of how okay how am i going to make this work as a business in my community who do i need to know to 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 help um, advance these ideas and to, um, uh, tap into, you know, funding that's available for, for nonprofit organizations. And then, um, you know, you're off to the races. Brilliant. Brilliant. William, that's a perfect place to conclude. 
Thank you so much for sharing with us this afternoon. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, your your expertise and your deep insights there into the profession and standing inside being a mission driven practice. So. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. It's been really fun. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.